Now what I'm going to show you is an example of taking a servlet that has been written with all the model view and control in one servlet and then we're going to split that up into individual servlets so that the components are properly separated. So let's start off by looking at the HTML. Here is the form. The action that we're going to put in here, of course, is the URL for the servlet that we want to activate. Uh, we're doing a get method here and we're passing in a taxi num and a taxi location as data that's been entered in a text box by the user. And then there's the submit button here. This URL, no MVC separation, will be used by the servlet container. It will, of course, consult the web.xml file and will find the URL pattern, no MVC separation which gives it the servlet name MVC start and then the servlet tag which has the same servlet name will identify that the class that we're using is servlets.mvc start which is this class here. So here's the servlet with everything all bundled up into one servlet exactly as we've been writing since the beginning of the, the module. So what we have then is the setting up of the output stream and then within a try block we're going to get from the request those two parameters the user supplied data taxi num and location and store those as strings in these variables here then we're going to output some header information for the html file fairly standard stuff then we have to think about the data that we've got and here we've got a business rule the business rule states that taxi num and location must both have some data in them. And if they are, then what we're going to do is to process that data simply by echoing it back straight to the web browser. So it's not a very sophisticated manipulation of data, but that's not the point. Uh, we're wanting to focus on other things. Else, well, else means that one or both of the items of data were empty. And so we then must output a message and detect if taxinum is empty, output a message to say the taxinum is missing, and then if the location is empty, output a message to say the location is missing. If they're both empty, because we're not using an else if, and that's quite important, because they're both empty, we want both messages to appear. And so by having a sequence of ifs, if one is missing, and then if the other is missing, we'll get both messages. Let's use as an example some really quite absurd example. What if we had 100 data items that the user had to type in? And let's assume that the user has typed in absolutely nothing and clicked the submit button. That means that there would be 100 messages potentially. If we had written the code in this way, then the very first one that was missing would set that condition to be true and that message would be output and because of the else all the other 99 messages would not be output just a single message now you think that might be quite a useful thing to do don't want to overload the user but the problem is that's one message so the user thinks oh all right and goes and corrects the problem and clicks submit and now that condition is false so we then come on to here and that one becomes true so the message is output and then you've got another 98 else if, else if, else if, and so on. And there you get skipped over because of the else if. And so only one message goes back to the user. And the user thinks, oh, oh, okay, I'll correct that one and click submit. Do you really think that the user will get to message number 100 with the 100th correction? I don't think so. And therefore, to help our users as much as possible, we output as many diagnosis messages as we can so that they can get the full picture as quickly as possible and understand okay they might be overloaded with 100 messages in the first instance but at least they know what's gone wrong let's make with our validation here and our reporting let's make these ifs a sequence of ifs rather than one big if else if statement finally after all that we need to output the trailing html tags end of body and so on. Once all that's been done, we're using a finally block to make sure that the output stream back to the web browser has been closed. Now let's think about what we've got here. That's all one servlet. 
But let's think about the responsibilities and the components that are embodied in here. We have, to begin with, a little bit of model, get the data. And then, further down here, we've got process the data, but only if, and therefore we've got some control. So we've got some decision making taking place. We've also got here some output information. So that's view. So we've got model, view, control, model, a bit more control. This lot is all about view, what messages to send back, and then more view. It's all jumbled up into one program, and that's not desirable. If we wanted to, we could stick with a single server, but then we would want to separate all the model and view and control into individual methods within that one servlet. But you can't have a very big system and do it all in one servlet, so we might as well look at how to do it in several servlets. Let's do that. In the project, let's look at the control first. In the try block, what we simply do is invoke the MVC model servlet. So remember, what we put in here in the request dispatcher is the URL of that servlet and then dispatch using an include. Then, assuming that everything works, the model servlet will return, and then we're going to invoke the MVC view servlet. Which servlets are they? We need to go back to the WebXML file and find the MVC model pattern. So we're looking for the URL MVC model. There it is. And the name for that is the MVC example model which, if we come back up to the servlet tags, the MVC example model is that one with the class MVC example model. If we find that class, MVC example model .java, here is our servlet that is the model component of this interaction. It gets that information there. The business rule is that they must both have a value, and therefore our implementation of that business rule is to check. If they don't have values, if just one of them is missing a value, then we're going to throw this servlet exception. So we're creating a new instance of the servlet exception and we're putting in a message. That is the end of processing. If there was no problem, that is both data items have got values, therefore the business rule has been satisfied. In a more complicated environment, we would then go on and process that. But in this very simple example, the process is, well, I've checked it, there are no problems, now let's return. On the other hand, if there is a problem, it's going to come back by throwing an exception. So back in the controller, we're going to invoke that with an include, and one of two things will happen. Either there will be no problem, and therefore control returns to this line, and will then continue with invoking the view, or this will start, the servlet will be executed, the model servlet, an exception will be thrown because there's a problem, which means the try block aborts, and we then start looking through the catch block to see if there's a handler. Well, it was a servlet exception that was thrown, and therefore this block will catch it. And all we're going to do from here is to get that error message, and if it is equal to the, the phrase input error, then what we're going to do is to invoke the error view instead. Because if we come back to the original monolith, we can see that there were two kinds of views. There was the normal process and the view for I've got some errors. In the controller then, we will invoke the model. If there's no problem, we will invoke the normal view of the data. Otherwise, if there is a problem, we will invoke the error view. Let's have a look at those two views. The normal view is going to have the output stuff that was in the in here. So if I come up there. There was all that output stuff that is now in the the view for the normal data. And then we've got the bit of the view that processes the data and presents it in the way that we want it. And then we've got the end if we then look at the error view, we'll find that the same stuff for the header is, in, is here, so it's been duplicated now. So we might have a bit of a problem there. 
It might offend our sensibilities about you should only write stuff once if you can. Come back to that in a moment. We've also got the duplication of the, the trailer. And in the middle of that, we've got the processing of the invalid data. So we've now got two separate views, and that's all controlled by the controller. Invoke the model, and then depending upon the response, invoke the normal view or invoke the error view. Now what about these two views that have got duplicated code? Well, we now can see that it's very easy for one servlet to invoke another. So if we've got a servlet here, sorry, two servlets, that have got exactly the same bit of code, then extract that, put it into a, we might call it a header servlet. And then we can invoke the header servlet from each one of the views. And likewise with the trailing bit, we might call that a trailer servlet, and invoke that one from each one of the view servlets. Being able to invoke servlets like this is actually a really useful thing to be able to do because we can separate the concerns, we can compartmentalize the common bits, put them in a servlet, and then invoke those whenever we need them. That essentially is MVC in an internet application. So your work during the tutorial this week will be to design interactions, or will involve interactions, that essentially look like that. And this is what we've just done. We had a request come in, there was one controller, it invoked one model, but then it had a choice of views, so there were two views that could have come from here. Now, as you go on into this mo module, you'll be developing applications that have got multiple requests going into a single controller. The controller for each request will then invoke one or more model components, one or more view components. And so you're going to have to plan that. And these kinds of diagrams, which are essentially an invention for this module, it will be good for you to write diagrams similar to that. We're calling those component diagrams. And so when you're asked in the tutorials to write component diagrams, well, use something like this.